Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the Bengal Tiger Podcast. I'm Matthew Bruni, and joining me today from War Chant, our Florida State on three site, is Aslan Hadravandi. Aslan, how are you doing today? Matthew, I'm great, man. Uh, hopefully, I have power by the time everybody's watching this. I'm, I am in Tallahassee, so hoping to uh, dodge Edalia as much as possible. Yeah, hope everything's all right uh, with y'all, and hope everything's uh, all right with Florida State's preparation. We would hate for them to have to take a day or two off. Uh, from preparing for this uh, major game in week week one, yeah, they got their IPF. They got some generators on campus. I think they'll figure it out. We, uh, what was it? Two years ago, my first year with the uh, with LSU was uh, LSU was going to UCLA to play, obviously uh, to play oh, UCLA, okay. and yeah. that's when Hurricane hit, and they had to move their practice to Houston, and then they go and lose to UCLA in a game where. I and a lot of people were very confident they were going to win, and then they go out and absolutely get smoked uh, by UCLA. Yeah, wasn't uh, wasn't Orgeron talking smack to like a UCLA fan? He's like, oh, you're blue, and you're blue shirt, get out of here, you're blue sissy shirt. Blue. Sissy, yeah, sissy blue, sissy blue, yeah. sissy blue. Yeah, so great. Yeah. What a time! What a time! What a time indeed. My one year covering at Orgeron was truly remarkable. Yeah. So, um, but anyways, enough about that. Uh, let's talk about this game, uh, LSU Florida State Sunday prime time, six thirty. Biggest game of the week, one of the biggest non-conference games of the year, one of the biggest games of the year. Um, I just uh, did y'all's podcast over at War Champ. I'm gonna flip the table on you, flip the script on you a little bit. Uh, what about Florida State? If we just start generally. I mean, because they have so much returning talent, a lot of it's known. What what's different about this Florida State team from from last year's team? I guess let's start offensively. Something happened to Jordan Travis after that three game losing streak that they endured last year, and, and you could you know people might astutely point out it, it was the fact that they played a bunch of pretty lousy teams with backup quarterbacks. Um, but you know, I guess you know Florida might fall into that sort of mix. I mean, they had a really good quarterback as a first round pick, but yeah. you know, Oklahoma didn't have their full capabilities. So I see how people can, you know, maybe not put a lot of stock in the way they played. Yeah. And I'm not one of those guys either that looks at the way a team played in a bowl game. Like, Oh, that's, that's what they're going to carry that moment momentum into the next season. But it's just been the luxury of covering this team is that Mike Norvell allows us to literally watch every single practice with the exception of scrimmages, but we can watch the entire thing start to finish a uh, spring, preseason and, and this game week preparation. And, and that kid is just a genuine, real deal, high performing quarterback, man. His, his accuracy um, is, is really uh, improved greatly over the course of his career at Florida State. You know, in the spring felt really good about where they were going to be with with Johnny Wilson. They had added Jaheim Bell. Uh, their running game obviously was something that what they leaned on. But when they added Keon Coleman, I was like, are you see-? that's like that's not even fair. Mm-hmm. And then to see it play out. I just think that this this went from kind of a, a run first team, you know, we want to do that first and foremost. That was their plan against Oklahoma. Oklahoma yeah. stopped them in the first half from running the ball. So then Jordan Travis ends up throwing for 400 yards practically in the second half. I think this team, I don't want to say like a pass first, but they are going to be a very refined passing game. And Jordan Travis showed some of that against LSU last year. But I just think with the weapons he has now, um, it's just, it's something that, you know, luckily for LSU fans, I don't really think you're going to see a lot of it this year, but you're going to see it in week one. So I think mm-hmm. what he's done at quarterback, uh, what they've done on the offensive line, that the playmakers that they've added, Jaheim Bell and Keon Coleman, it's, it's ridiculous. And defensively, their defensive line with Braden Fisk, I mean, he's a guy that Southern Cal wanted, Notre Dame wanted, but they get, were able to get him, add him and pair him next to Fabian, love it. And then Jared Verse, I mean, I, I just spoke about Flores saying how good I feel about them and how different they are for five minutes here in rambling. Mm-hmm. And I didn't mention the guy that's, you know, maybe behind Harold Perkins will be the highest graded yeah. drafted guy of anybody on that football field. That dude, what they have on the interior, they're eh, at linebacker. They are they're, eh, at linebacker. But I, mm-hmm. I almost think that linebacker is the running back of, of defense in 2023. Like, sure, it'd be nice to have one that's really elite and awesome, but you can probably make do with uh, linebacker play, if you got really good, talented guys that are going to disrupt the pocket and pretty solid coverage. Love their cornerbacks. I think they've grown a lot. They've added Fen Charles Cypress, who's an all-ACC guy. Safety, we'll see. They're, you know, they're still a little bit hit and miss there. But ultimately, I just feel, man, they have, they have added really dynamic, talented guys. We've seen them practice against each other. And you get a kind of a good feel for how it's going to work, the way it's going to look LSU rushing against Jordan Travis, the way it's going to look this defensive line trying to pressure Jaden Daniels. And I just think like over 60 minutes, 
I think Florida State just might have the edge on the, on the trenches enough to to pull this one out. Yeah, you, you mentioned the changes offensively. Um, I had watched the you know, the Florida game, the NC State game. I, I talked we talked about this on on your your show, but um, it, it really stood out to me how I don't want to say reliant, but the past game was you know Johnny Wilson in a lot of ways, and then you had Michael Pittman, but is more of I think he averaged ten yards per per catch last year. It just wasn't as dynamic when you got off of Wilson. Is that the biggest change to this offense is like, okay, we have Coleman now too who can go 50-50 on you, where last year it was really just Wilson. It's it it is. It's it's not fair, man. Like I, I listen, clip this and, and make fun of me, LSU fans, if if you know they end up locking them down like they got Tyron Matthew and Patrick uh Peterson back there. But by all means do it. But just it's watching him, he, he's just a different it's a different tool, it's a different weapon. You know, Johnny six seven. Um, he's not necessarily just a straight line guy, but there's there's some sort of you know wiggle, if you will, some kind yeah. of fast twitchy stuff that he doesn't have, but Keon Coleman does have, mm-hmm. and Keon Coleman still has enough length at like six four that yeah he can body you up and and, and jump up and high point it. Um, so like the, they got those two guys. So I, I don't know. I, I don't know how you defend that. Yeah. All the while accounting for you know what Jordan's going to do, but I don't want to go too far in the weeds. But yeah, seeing what Keon Coleman did took me from thinking that this team could, you know, win the ACC, which by virtue of that maybe gets you back door into the playoff if it's an okay season mm-hmm. in this conference. But like seeing Keon Coleman is it made me believe that this team, like ACC is totally within their reach of winning. Now it's like, can they, can they beat an LSU to really put an exclamation point? Uh, not really an exclamation point, but to, to let the country know that like Florida State truly is back Just seeing what he can do. Uh, and the way that Jordan can find him and Johnny and Jaheim Bell is just like, yeah, this is a legitimate, you know, passing attack with with NFL weapons. Yeah, and then the offensive line is is interesting to me because, um, you know, I, I fought against Florida last year. They they were okay. There were some moments where the the pass rush, the front four of Florida, got the better of them. Uh, bring in two transfers, uh, return starters at the other spots, pretty much. Is like how. Where on the spectrum are you with this offensive line? Is it really, really good? Is it great? Is it just good? Like how how do you assess how good the offensive line is? Like on a grading scale, old school. I mean, I give them like a B. I think they're like they're above average. Like if a yeah. C is average, a B is above average, and A is excellent. I mean, I think they're a, they're a solid B. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, in practice, I've seen them you know get whipped. Like I, the guys that they're going to roll out there starting five, I've seen them get beat on one on ones. I've seen them get beat when they do eleven on elevens. But they're getting beat by really talented guys that I don't know necessarily maybe LSU has. Like if Mason Smith was in in the mix, then you're like, all right, yeah, they for sure have that kind of guy. But I don't know if the guys at LSU is going to rely on in in week one are going to play at the level that maybe like a Fabian Lovett and a Jared Verse and a Braden Fisk can. But this offensive line, I mean, the interior, Maurice Smith is an undersized center, but man, he's played so much football. Seemingly every year they've recruited somebody to come in and take the job away from him. And he's just held on. Sounds like the- LSU. LSU's in the same spot with Charles Turner as you know, where it feels like they were going to move on from him. And he just keeps holding down the spot. It's what he does, man. Just Maurice Smith just shows up every day and, and figures out a way to, to be the best option for them at center. Casey Roddick is a, is a large human being that they snatch away from Colorado. Demetri Emanuel is a sixth year guy. Uh, that was at Charlotte. That Alex Atkins coach for one year. They brought him in last year. Um, you know, he's another stout dude, you know, and then tackles, they brought in Jeremiah Byers from UTEP played something like almost a thousand snaps in his career at right tackle. A lot of people thought that maybe he'd be cross-trained on the interior. He might've been during spring, but he's been primarily a tackle, uh, for them throughout, uh, fall camp here. So I I think he's going to most likely be able to hold off bless Harris for one of those tackle spots. And, And Robert Scott's a guy that they recruited out of high school, you know, during a COVID year. Uh, that they said, you know, that this is going to be our probably our starting left tackle for the future. And he's kind of and he, he doesn't look the part. He's the, the nicest, sweetest dude, human being out there. And just like, you know, his upper body doesn't match what you maybe would think yeah. of being like this kind of prototypical left tackle. But man, they, they love what he brings to the table. So, you know, with all the experience they have again, man, Roddick has played so much football at Colorado. Demetri Mayo is a six year guy. Uh, you know, Jeremiah Byers, again, played like something like a thousand snaps in his career, started a whole bunch. I know it's UTEP. Uh, Maury Smith has been playing. I mean, Maury Smith is here when, when Willie Taggart was at Florida state and then Robert Scott's been playing left tackle for them since COVID. Um, I mean, they're so experienced and, and they know where everyone's got to go. They know how to communicate well. Yeah. Um, so, you know, physically can they hold up probably? And I think they've got it between their ears to, you know, stick, 
stick close enough with LSU and, and the sort of tricks that probably Matt House is going to want to throw at them to, to mix things up. Yeah, I, I, I mentioned it earlier. It's like on the other side of the ball, it's LSU's O-line against uh, Florida State's defensive line is just the juggernauts going at each other. And the other side, it's not bad, obviously. It's it's high level. I mean, you know, all SEC, Makai Wingo, and then you have Florida State, a really solid offensive line. It's But it's – it's still very important to who wins this game, even if it's not the juggernauts going at each other here. Um, it feels like, you know, obviously you, you know so much and we, we know a lot of, of what Florida state's expected to is, are there any possession uh, positions that are still, that you're still kind of uncertain about who the starter is going to be or how exactly it's going to work out. I know you mentioned um, one of the tackle spots, but is that kind of the only one where you're like, I'm not sure who exactly is going to start or how the rotation is going to work. Yeah, the, you know, the depth chart they released on Monday looks pretty accurate to what we had seen uh, throughout the preseason and, and even thinking about what we saw in spring and we're forecasting for. So I, I think they got three guys they feel good about at tackle. And, and, you know, I think Robert Scott's got left tackle figured out. So it's going to be between Jeremiah Byers and Bless Harris at right tackle. Bless Harris was a guy that started last year, but he got injured in the, in the week zero game against Duquesne. Mm-hmm. So he was out against LSU in New Orleans. Um, otherwise, I mean, the way the depth chart, again, it, it pretty much lines up to what we had seen. But in, if you want to talk about like a deficiency, maybe, I mean, offensively, I don't think Florida State has any. I mean, I, I really don't. And again, you know, people think I'm some kind of homer. I've got an L- you know, FSU tag behind me. Like, so I went to Florida State, everybody. Yes, I went to Florida State. Uh, but like, I've been doing this now for five years in which everyone, you know, it's the dream job, right? To cover like your, your, your dream school, your favorite school, your alma mater. But man, like when you, when you do it as a job, Matthew, you can probably speak to this. Like you see the way the sausage is made, like you lose some of the romanticism, you lose some yeah. of the love. So, and, and like the coaching staff, they're, they're good dudes. Uh, but like, I, I don't, I, I do not feel the way I did as like 20 year old Aslan living and dying yeah. with every single snap that Florida State did. So I'm coming at you folks as objectively possible as I can. Um, yeah, the defensive line thing is going to be quite nasty. I, I, the linebacker play, I still think, might not is not elite. Um, it might be C level. I don't mm-hmm. know how you can maybe exploit that if you're LSU. I mean, there there are ways to exploit it, but I don't know how they're going to want to go about doing that and just how sturdy of an idea that is to to base your game plan on. Yeah. Um, and then safety too. I mean, Akeem Dent's played a lot of football, but he's also made a lot of mistakes playing a lot of football. And Shaheen Brown's a guy that's kind of moving into a new role. Uh, starting with J- with Jamie Robinson having moved to the next level. So, you know, safety is a little bit maybe a soft spot. Linebacker, not nearly as elite as LSU is. And then I like their cornerbacks, um, but it is 2023. These guys are liable to, to fall into a rut and have a bad sort of sequence or two. But I, I think they've got enough guys that can, you know, Malik Neighbors is going to go off. I just think that maybe there won't be, you know, a second guy that they're going to have yeah. to be too concerned about. Yeah. Yeah, so everybody listening is uh, opening their phones in Louisiana and betting the over in this game, as <laughs> as we speak here. <laughs> I think it's like um, fifty eight points. I think is the over on lot. it. So it's, it's just, a lot. That is a lot of points for these two teams that are that are really physical and and, and two really good coaches. Yeah. I, I don't want to dive into that one, but yeah, I mean, no, go ahead if you got if you got a. <laughs> no, I wish I could. People I in Louisiana will will live for betting uh, predictions or betting talk. So <laughs> I just man, I it's. I'm not comparing this team at all to 2019 LSU. Everybody, y'all are amazing. Do it. The best team ever. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. Don't. Don't. Don't aggregate me, Matthew. But like they didn't score 30 points in the game against Auburn. But and I'm not saying Florida State's going to average 50 points like LSU. There's going to be a game or two where Florida State's probably not going to score 30 points. But man, it's hard to think how Florida State will not find a way to score 30 points or more in pretty much every game this year. But I think LSU. I think Jaden Daniels, man, is is going to be dynamic. I think. You know, he's in a place now where he has the most sort of like cohesion and continuity yeah. that he's ever had around him in college. Brian Kelly, I think, probably thinks that he, he might have this might be the best quarterback Brian Kelly's ever had in his career. So I, I think they feel really good about each other there. And yeah, I mean, listen, Florida State's offensive line might be able to get past that elite LSU def- offensive line at times. I mean, Jane Daniels is going to tuck and run sometimes too. So I, yeah, take the over as well. Over the over, everybody. Let's head on the over bus. Take the over. Um, I don't even remember what I was going to ask you, but um, uh, I was going to ask you about the linebackers because it is an interesting conversation where it's like y- you return them. They weren't great last year. You return them. So at least at the very least, Florida State has some cohesion there. You're not just rolling out a guy from Juco or a transfer from wherever to, to see if they fill gaps. Um, And it is interesting in how exactly in 2023 – 
you know, I've, I think I've looked on Twitter and seen like, you know, people who do like personnel stuff for NFL and everything. They're like, you know, you rank the positions by importance. And it's like bottom is like linebacker and running back pretty right. much nowadays. Right. Yeah. So it's like, how do you attack them? And obviously for LSU, it's different because you have Harold Perkins, who is a linebacker, but not really a linebacker. So it's weird. But uh, yeah, it's Florida State at linebacker is going to be interesting to maybe if LSU gets to the second level and make plays. I know uh, LSU fans saw Greg Penn last year and they were all up in arms about him. So maybe there is some gap scheme stuff LSU can do. But ultimately, um, I do think, you know, it's going to be won and lost in the trenches. Like you're, if LSU is going to have to block them in the run game, in the pass game, you're going to have to block Love It. You're going to have to block Fisk and, and um, Burst and all these guys. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to I just wanted to say that because that is an interesting part of this game where that's their that's their weakness, but it's like how exactly do you exploit that? And I'm sure there's people on our board that are going to be messaging me like this is how you this is how you do it and everything. But but can you for 60 minutes? So like I don't think you can do that for 60 minutes. Like if a, if a team's got a really bad defensive line, yeah, all day you can do whatever you want. Yeah. They got really bad coverage all day, but it's like they got bad linebackers. There's there's things you can ultimately do probably to compensate for that over the course of 60 minutes. I don't think you no no team has ever, no great team has ever lost a game because they had poor linebacker play for the entire sort of stretch. Yeah. And they got exposed like, Oh, they had bad linebackers. That's why they, they lost that game. You know? So yeah, it, it's, it's interesting. Again, um, I'll put this on our board and I'm going to have at least five people tell me this is how you beat a team with bad linebackers. But um, it is, it is an interesting aspect of this game that I'm interested to see. Hey, maybe it does come back to bite. I don't know. Maybe yeah. a linebacker completely misses a gap and you know, the run is gone, but regardless, uh, I, I want to ask you, um, who's a player on this Florida state team that is, would be classified as underrated or a sleeper going into this game that could potentially have a big impact. I mean, Braden Fisk, I think is a guy that, you know, maybe some LSU fans have heard cause he was in the portal. I don't, I don't think LSU was involved with him, but you know, again, he's a guy that, you know, Marcus Freeman at Notre Dame wanted Southern Cal desperately wanted him to help, you know, fix their monstrosity, ridiculous defense, which, I mean, Caleb Williams, we got this generational quarterback, and he's never going to be able to play in a big time game because he doesn't have a defense. So thanks for that, Lincoln. Sounds right. like Oklahoma. Yeah, exactly. Right. And it's funny how that followed him all the way out west. Um, you know, I think Fisk is a guy that, you know, LSU fans are be like, dang, that guy's a pain in the neck. Uh, so I, yeah. I think 55 on the on the interior of the defensive line is a guy that maybe LSU fans don't maybe fully account for that uh, could impact the game. I, mean, I don't want to call Jaheim Bell an underrated no, guy. Give me, give me a deeper, a deeper, like a, it doesn't have to be second string per se, but it maybe a rotation guy, something like that. Um, I'm trying to think I mean, of an LSU player I would consider Dest in this. Does Destin Hill count? Like y'all let him leave your state? What are y'all doing? I mean, you guys even go out for Keon hard enough, apparently. Um, I mean, dude, Destin Hill is atop their depth chart. Mm -hmm. uh, Destin Hill is a legitimate weapon like in the slot as like a number three receiver for them with Keon Coleman and, and then Johnny Wilson on the outside, man. So, you know, I'm not saying Destin's going to go for six and 90 and a tutty, but like he, he might, he's, yeah. if he catches the ball, I guarantee it's going to be a for, for a first down. Uh, you know, it's not going to be like a little three yard check down kind of play. Um, so, I mean, Destin Hill's a guy and then Marquise and Douglas, if you want to go you know, a deep cut, yeah, man, he's a 280 pound tight end lumbering kind of dude. But he just finds ways to body guys up and work leverage really well downfield and, and position himself to to be a nice target downfield as like a safety valve kind of guy. So he's a guy that's kind of quasi third on the depth chart now behind Kyle Morlock, who who yeah, transferred yeah. in from Shorter, who's like six foot six. Obviously Jaheim Bell. So Marquise and Douglas, Destin Hill, and and Rodney Hill is an explosive running back. I mean, mm -hmm. he just has a different kind of aura, a buzz around him when he's got the ball in his hands. I mean, they love Trey Benson. Trey Benson is going to be their bell cow for sure. But um, if they get the ball in Rodney Hill's hand and he gets past the first level, it, it's it's problems. It can be problems. Yeah. Um, you know, this is an LSU podcast, so we got to get some negativity for Florida hey, State here. Uh, what, what What is the one concern you have? And it doesn't have to be personnel-wise. It can be like, you know, it can be anything as far as if, if you're scared of, you know, Malik Neighbors or something like that. If anything that – concerns you really going into this nope nope Nothing Florida State's gonna win big no um clip it it's already clipped so <laughs> just roll with it at this point I mean again like linebacker and safety I mean it's not just linebacker but you know safety's been a little bit of a spotty kind of position for them here uh throughout you know uh, spring and then going into camp again a guy like Akeem Dent's played a lot of football but we've seen him kind of you know 
you know, miss on assignments and it happens. Um, but I mean, that's, that's, that's two levels of a defense that, that has a little bit of softness to it. So there might be something there that, you know, Denbrock and, and Jaden Daniels can figure out a way to exploit, you know, Mason Taylor is going to be a, you know, maybe that's Mason Taylor. Maybe that's, that's the kind of matchup you're thinking about. Maybe for an LSU fan, like, you know, a linebacker is probably going to be the guy that's going to line up on Mason Taylor, a safety. It, it might be the guy that ends up having to match up with him. And that, that would be a huge, I think, advantage for LSU in those situations. There's, yeah, even the Florida State cornerbacks, I, I wouldn't really like in a matchup with with Mason Taylor. So that that can be one of those things that that really pays dividends for LSU in this game. And you know, not to be generic on it, but it's it's all about affecting the quarterback at, at this point. In, in, in you know, when you're dealing with a guy that's as talented as Jordan Travis and guy that's as talented as Jaden Daniels, man, you get in their face rushing four, like you've got a chance. I I just don't know if I don't know if Florida State can get to Jaden Daniels consistently with only four guys. I don't know if Floors, if if LSU can get to Jordan Travis consistently with just four guys, but man, if they hit Jordan Travis, he's he's missed games, he's missed quarters, he's missed halves of games getting hit, which seems like in a natural kind of way, like not necessarily taking a really bad shot. But yeah, man, if Harold Perkins comes blindsiding on him, you know, and knocks him out of the game, then that that changes everything. That changes the entire calculus of the game. Yeah, and but it's two quarterbacks that aren't. I'm not gonna say they're skinny by any means, but they're they're not the, the thick. Yeah, a little yeah, slight. Slight. Right? There yeah. you go, slight. That's a good word. That sounds like it's not demeaning or anything. Yeah. So, yeah, it is. Then, obviously, LSU will fans will be like, "Well, you have Garrett Nussmeyer behind him, who they love and I love." But regardless, um, yeah, the quarterback position is obviously interesting. Uh, last thing, I guess. Um, I guess we, we've already talked about so much. I feel like, I mean, receiver wise, you feel good about what about the um, kicking game? What about special teams, Matthew? I mean, Florida say it's going to be Ryan Fitzgerald who was their kicker last year. He, he had a really bad rut last year, like pretty much after the LSU game. Um, but kind of came on towards the end of the year. He, he, I think he knocked like a 48 yarder against Florida. He, he had a game winning field. I, I know it was, it was a game winning field goal, but Oklahoma still had time to, to respond. Yeah. And it was, it was inside like 35 yards. So I'm not like, calling it an epiphany cleansing moment. But like I if if it came down to Florida State down by two, kicking a 42 yard field goal, I still don't feel terribly confident with where they're at um kicking the ball. Um yeah. but you know you guys had some problems, you know, blocking up a yeah, I was gonna say I, I but hey Bob Diaco's <laughs> got it fixed man. Bob Diaco's got it covered I bet. I bet Bob Diaco's got it fixed. Um yeah so so it can't be a game winning field goal unless the kicker is getting carried off the field. That's what Aslan's saying. There pretty much, pretty much. There you go. Right. We'll see. Um, all right. I think that's it. Uh, well, I guess you want to give your prediction. Go ahead. Give your prediction. Pain. <laughs> um, shout out to my guy Clubber Lang, Rocky Three. Come on, LSU fans. Uh, we can all agree that Rocky was uh, Rocky Three is one of the better ones. Maybe not the best Rocky film. Where do you have it? Where do you have it ranked in the Rocky? Ah, <sighs> ah. Maybe third, probably Rocky Four is my favorite. Then the original, then maybe Rocky Three. Hmm. So, so you um, don't like Rocky actually winning the fight in Rocky Two? You just you like him losing all the fights leading up to him. And I mean, well, he beat Clubberling eventually, but yeah, yeah lost, just, uh, Rocky. I don't know Rocky Two. The montages though, when like Adrian's in the hospital and she's mm. like, Do, you know, come here, let me yeah. win. Like that, I just got chills. Just I hollow dying. You just you just like oh, the that was, that was Rocky Four, man. But then he avenges his death. Well, I know, I know. But I'm saying you you had that really high on your list. So I'm just saying you're. It's all about the montages, Matthew. The montage in Rocky Four when he tells Adrian he's gonna go fight Drago, and then she tells him that he's gonna lose and get killed, and he gets in his car and drives. That's one of the best montages in, in cinematic history. So that's gotta be my number one. Dude, all yeah, right, man. prediction for the game. I did say the over on this. Listen again, man. I, I do think that Florida has got a, an extremely talented defensive line, and I think LSU might be able to match them there. But I, I think matching them still means that Florida is going to be able to disrupt uh, the LSU attack enough. I think Jaden Daniels still finds ways to make plays because of the way he can just move and operate in the pocket. So I, I definitely I, I think this is still going to be within the margin. When we talked about this game like 10 days ago on, on the podcast that you did for us, um, I'd be like, yeah, man, just take Florida State on the money line. I, I still think this can be a really, um, you know, tight game for three quarters. And in the fourth quarter, we'll see who's going to be able to outlast the other one and, and, and make the chess moves after looking at everything for three quarters. Um, but, man, I just I feel like, man, it just 
I've seen Florida State put themselves in all these situations in practice where it's one minute, it's 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 four minute trying to run the clock out. It's it's putting the ball in the three yard line in a fourth down situation, trying to figure out a way to, to score. I just seen them in so many different situations in practice, and I know it's practice, but deliver against a really talented defense. And I think there's enough not typical LSU caliber sort of talent on the defensive side of the ball right now, man, that Florida State will be able to find a way to best them uh, in enough crucial situations in this game. So if I'm going to take the overall, now I'll, I'll take Florida State 34, LSU 30. Sounds good. So, so you take the plus two and a half too, or you could take the money line. You could make it worth any way you want. I still want the two and a half just to be safe, just to be honest. Because I don't. It doesn't make any sense to me, Matt. It really does. I'm, I'm surprised that LSU. I'm, I'm really surprised that LSU's favored. I really am, man. Like, I'm not. I'm not trying to take a shot at LSU. Listen, LSU yeah. could lose this game and run the table and still make it to the playoff. Um, I, I, I would not be surprised by that at all, man. I think that this offense by you know October, November is going to be really, really crazy dangerous. I just don't defensively, maybe Mason Smith comes back and then that'll be the the elixir for them on that side of the ball. Um, so I'm, I'm not, I'm, I hope people, think I'm, not, I'm not just, I, I got plenty of respect for LSU, man, but I just, I, and listen, I wanted Mike Norvell run out of town when they started off 0-4 and they lost to Jacksonville State. They, clip that, man. That, it's out there. I'm like, man, he's 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 another Tom Herman. He's a Scott yeah. Frost, a Willie Taggart. He's an AAC guy that can't win at this level. Yeah. And I, I was wrong, man. I was completely wrong on this guy. So, um, maybe I'm atoning. Maybe I'm trying to compensate for all that kind of stuff. Um, but I still want to, I'll still take the two and a half. I just, yeah, I mean, you know, Mason Taylor, Jaden Daniels, Malik neighbors, uh, you know, that offensive line, that's, that's going to be problematic for, for a lot of teams this year. And Florida State's no exception. I just think Florida State will make a, a, an extra play or two in this game that will be the deciding factor. I just hope it's a great game. Like, la- yeah. like last year, man, is in the Superdome. Oof, what a game. Um, all right, that's all we got. Uh, thank you, Aslan, for joining us. Um, uh, for those listening, we're going to try to do one of these every week. Uh, we didn't do this last year, but we're going to try to have a be right on from the opposing team on every Wednesday, so stay tuned for those. On Friday, Shay and I will have our final uh, preview podcast out, so stay tuned for that as well. If you're listening, leave us a five-star rating review. Wherever you are listening on Apple, Spotify, all that good stuff. Aslan, thanks for joining. Santa, my mentions, y'all. Have a great weekend and great season, everybody. Thanks, Matthew. Appreciate it. Appreciate it.